companies act. A special presentation by The Firm. In the last five months, the over 9,81,000 companies in India have all moved to a new law, the Companies Act 2030. 29 chapters, 470 sections, seven schedules and dozens of amendments. It's been a life-changing five months for India. We are moving in the right direction. You know, a lot of haziness is cleared. This is absolutely like a Brahmastra. Painful changes in the compliance aspect. Independent directors have found a sort of a new voice. It has widened the disclosure and levels of disclosure. Both will learn to live with this situation. Giving back to society is part of our Indian culture. But you can't put a gun on the head and do it. Is it the cart before the horse or the horse before <laughs> the cart? No matter how many barn doors you try to slam shut, the horse has bolted. We didn't deserve an act in today's day and age with so many inconsistencies. Well, what a journey it's been. And today, on this finale episode of this special series, Companies Act, we find out if it's all been worth it. To answer that question I have with me today, Amar Chand Mangaldas managing partner Cyril Shroff and the founder of leading proxy advisory and governance advisory firm IIS, Anil Singhvi. Gentlemen, to both of you, a very warm welcome to the finale episode of this special series. I want to start first by laying out the guiding principles that the JJ Irani committee put down for this new law way back in 2005. The committee advocated that it be a simplified compact law amenable to clear interpretation and that it should enable protection of the interest of the investors and other stakeholders. Mr. Shroff, I have a two-part question. The first one, in the design of this law, how far have we come in being able to achieve any or all of these three guiding principles? On the three criteria, I think we've done reasonably well on the last one in terms of minority protection and greater sort of perhaps a broader approach towards shareholder and good corporate governance. But on the simplicity and clarity, I think uh, we probably underachieved. And amenable to clear interpretation? Uh, not at all. I think that's, that all. is probably where uh, there is much more work to be done. And that is, uh, I think, a direct result of good intent but bad implementation in terms of drafting. I think we have all complex laws in India. I mean, look at income tax. I mean, it's more complicated than Companies Act. And we all pay taxes without knowing whether we should be really paying taxes or not, huh. uh, if you go by strict interpretations. So I think uh, complexity is there Can't very much. Yes, I okay. think in every every law which we have, maybe by nature or by, by uh, uh, genetics, we are, we are very complicated people, so we need complex laws. Having said this, I think the needle has moved to some extent as far as protecting the minority shareholder is concerned. It's been five or six months, Mr. Shroff, since this act, at least most parts of it have been notified. What has the experience been? How have companies adapted to it, adopted it and done the best they could with it? So if you leave aside um, a lot of the ambiguity in trying to seek interpretation and understanding, so if you leave aside some of those process issues, I think in substantive terms, it has had a profound impact. So uh, a lot of the boards that I interact with them, fortunately many of the sort of good boards or you know listed boards, they are now very cognizant of uh, corporate governance as a, a new benchmark that has been set, uh, broader stakeholder protection, uh, shareholder activism, uh, proxy advisory viewpoints being influencing how shareholders vote. So there's, the bar has definitely uh, gone up. Uh, directors, including independent directors, are significantly more careful in, how, in terms of how they formulate a view and they record their view to have shown that they have exercised their sort of duty of care. And it's not just a ticking the box or sort of form exercise. Many of them are doing it very substantively. Okay. There would be mixed experience, but if I compare my own experience in terms of, say, two years ago and now, there's a very big change. Would there be instances of when, let's say, just six months ago, they would have designed a transaction uh, you know, done a deal differently, but because now lots of the many provisions of, of the company, particularly can you give me an illustration so M&A or instance. restructurings which are taking place where there might be a perception, sometimes group restructuring, the minorities might be affected differently. There is a lot more thought that goes into it in terms of how the minority would be impacted. They may or may not necessarily come out at the perfect spot, but uh, two years ago they wouldn't even have given it a, you know, spent half a minute on it. Now they would spend days on it. That's the big difference. I think there's a change. There's a change in thinking. There's a change. I mean, earlier there was a complete contempt, if I may use the word, towards mm -hmm. minority shareholders. Now there is, at least there's an awareness, Not may not be respect. So from contempt, we have gone into awareness. I think finally it will get into respect, as Cyril rightly said, from 1st October 14 
So you have to look at the environment in which you are operating. So it is going to be Companies Act as one leg, CB amendment to clause 49 second, and third people like us. Yeah. Have you, I mean, just imagine Maruti, this new thing which is coming for Suzuki. Maruti has spent almost last four months going and meeting every investor. Would they have done it otherwise? No. There are many laudable features of the new company law. The one big area of change is the regulation of related party transactions. More disclosures, yes, but the law also requires transactions above certain thresholds to get 75% shareholder approval. And it restricts the related party from voting on the special resolution. The other positive changes include mandatory e-voting, auditor and independent director rotation for higher governance standards, and in some provisions, dissenting shareholders have been provided an exit. But some of these new measures seem diluted by recent amendments. For instance, the raising of thresholds for related party transactions that need shareholder approval, or the clarification on which related party cannot vote. America, the point is that if you realize that the most abusive part of today running the corporate is related party transactions. And we have seen in last two years of our deep dive into at least 500 companies, the biggest abuse is there in terms of related party transactions, be it royalty, remuneration, or appointment, or sale and purchase of goods on mm. that. So if you look at larger picture from the corporate ink point of view and where the minority shareholders are, I think related party is one of the major issues. And any dilution in that is really going away from that theme that you really want corporates to be accountable. Why India is different than other parts of the country, uh, parts of the world is largely on account of promoters. Whether it is MNCs or Indian companies, I'm not even sitting here on judgment of those because in fact, according to me, MNCs are more abusive of uh, this, this uh, related party transaction in terms of royalty yeah. than the promoters here, hmm. okay? But having said this, once they had 188 and then you come with an interpretation of who's related party and whether the related party is related to that particular transaction and then who can vote and who cannot vote is I think I think somewhere is just going I mean look at JSW. A JSW promoter company owned by the promoter's wife Sangeeta Jindal decided to charge group companies a brand royalty. At the JSW energy shareholder vote none of the promoter entities participated. Soon after, the MCA offered a general clarification that only the related party connected to the transaction need abstain. Thereafter, at the JSW Steel shareholder vote, only the promoter company owned by Sangeeta Jindal did not participate. Her husband Sajjan Jindal's promoter companies cast their votes. According to me, all general related pr promoter companies should have abstained from voting. Okay, let me bring the first issue to uh, Mr. Shroff on this. The dilution in transaction thresholds. I could either take the point that Mr. Singhvi argues, saying, no, why are we allowing some transactions to not be brought to the shareholders for approval? Or I could take the point that some companies have explained to me, saying, Minka, if you don't reduce the threshold or don't dilute them and thereby control the number of transactions going to shareholders, they're going to be overwhelmed Absolutely. by the absolute Absolutely. volume of transactions and they will miss the most important and not process. only that, I think the whole process of how the audit committees would function in terms of having to pre-approve everything, it was becoming completely overwhelming for them as well. So I think there is a right balance to be struck. Whether we have struck the balance so far is debatable. Yeah. But I think in terms of finding that middle ground, I don't think there's anything Wouldn't wrong you with agree? it. Because you, you want corporate India also to do business. It's not as you want to bring them to a standstill. We're not running a police state here. Why you is know? that and in India we have to have related party transactions for us to run the business? Why can't we have it that even if my brother is running a company, I won't buy from him because there will always be an element of some amount of favor That's granted or received case on scenario, this. Sir, no, it's not an ideal case scenario. Uh, we don't do it on a day-to-day basis in life. We do it all the time. We do it all the you time. You can wish it. away RPTs altogether. No, right? no, I'm not saying wishing it away. I'm saying idea should be to reduce it as much as possible as Rill said that then audit committee auditors are not really overwhelmed by the number of transactions. As so you do have my, my this view and again sort of also seeing it from the corporate side is that there's still a very vast array of transactions which are, that covered, are coming to shelves. That are coming okay, so to let's shareholders. Let's so it's not as if you sort of you've gone from uh, one extreme and back to zero. Well let's take the second issue mm -hmm. that Mr. Singh is raising. I won't take company names because I, you know I don't want you to have a conflict mm -hmm. issue here. But just the attempt to clarify 
which related party should vote on a related party transaction and should not vote was required because the proviso is badly worded. Correct. It seems to imply that no related party can vote, you know. And yet when it comes to some companies, they have taken a very beneficial interpretation of that to say that, oh, the promoter's wife cannot vote, but the promoter can vote. I mean, how... That's a See, ultimately, a why, why, why do all these clarifications of this type come about? They come about because of originally bad drafting. That goes to my original point of a lot of the ambiguity is because of poor drafting. You yes. could have made it black and white from the beginning. So once you clarify in accordance with what the framework is, if it's legal, it's legal. No, I Whether you know, it should be done or not is a separate issue. I'm not passing qualitative uh, comments on that. Even before the related party transaction thresholds were raised, one company escaped the net. Kane extended a $1.25 billion loan facility to a group company. Now, since the amount is within the limits set out in the section that governs loans by a company, Kane did not seek shareholder approval. It has also adopted an interpretation that Section 188, that's the Related Party Transaction section, does not apply. I'm just wondering, what is the point of putting this entire Related Party Transaction architecture in place if shareholders are not going to get to decide whether you can extend a $1 billion or more than that loan to a group company. I mean, I find that is a failure of the law, you know, even in places where the law is accused of having exceeded its brief. Yeah, completely in agreement with you. This was bizarre. I found it very, very bizarre that, that such a large transaction is escaping. And as, as Hillary rightly said, we are going to sit on some small transaction which is goods purchased or whatever other things which have been done. But if you have this kind of leeway uh, provided in the act, this, this, is, this is bad. I'm not going to comment on this one either. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I take a general point that is goods and services is a sort of a limiting thing. And should there be a discussion in relation to any kind of related party transaction, I think that conversation needs okay, to be Okay, let added. me put it to you non-company specific. If yeah. it's a transaction that gets covered under 185 or 186, which is a loan to a director mm -hmm. or a loan or to advance otherwise into a group, yeah, yeah. you know, then should sec related party transaction provisions apply to that transaction or not? Because if they don't and you're giving money intra-group or otherwise, and you're not giving your shareholders a chance to vote so on I think this. sort of leaving the facts of you know, particular cases aside, I think there has always been and there will always be a need for greater flexibility to move funds around in the group. In a conglomerate particularly, sort of you need to have that flexibility because parents need to support their subsidiaries, uh, sibling companies need to support their sibling companies, and that's how conglomerates work. That's the reality, provided that there are adequate disclosures. Here, uh, sort of situation that are emerging, it is emerging because of the fact that related party transactions in the context of 188 have been defined specifically for goods and services. Should there be a broader discussion in terms of any kind of related party arrangements or not? As I said, that's a conversation that needs to be had and it'll cut both ways. But 188 should be uh, superimposing and, and powerful than 185 and 186. So but I have to have amend the law for that. The, absolutely. So, so the law, as you rightly pointed out, and in, in, in case of Ken, it, it, it really requires that kind of amendment to come in or a clarification to come in that yes, a transaction of this nature should be covered by 188, not going by 185 and 186. Why would you need to amend the law if I may ask you that, sir? The ministry said that 188 does not apply to schemes through a circular, right? Thereby clarifying the situation. And I think that logic It for did that not say it does not apply to schemes and it does not apply no, to I transactions under the under logic over there is that because in a scheme of arrangement, there is a court which looks at it. Yes, and so I therefore that I there understand why 188 does so not apply to schemes. So schemes is a separate scheme. category. Yeah. But I don't there think is no court that looks at 185, 186. The MCA itself withheld, you know, any clarification on that. One could draw the assumption that since it did not say it does not apply to 185, 186, it should apply to 185, 186. I'm saying, why do you need an amendment? It's a matter of interpretation if the MCA made it clear, saying yes, 185 will apply to 185, so you know, 188 that. will apply to 185, 186. So let them 186. say that. Let them say that. I think on the on the law as it stands today, I think it's not the case. So if both of you are making the point that this law has served the purpose of better governance, then... It's not perfect. It's not I perfect. think it has moved the needle. Companies Act. A special presentation by The Firm. This problem of good intent but confusing outcomes plagued even the e-voting measure. Meant to enhance shareholder participation, e-voting has instead been postponed to next year. Because the provision is drafted to mean that voting at a meeting via a show of hands is not valid. But it offers no prescription for a replacement, implying that shareholders present at a meeting cannot vote. 
Eventually, this AGM season, some companies conducted paper ballots, some relied on a Bombay High Court judgment to offer e-polling, and others resorted to assent, dissent notes, and the like. This sort of legislation has to be drafted in consultation with people who practice and live it every day. That was not done. You, you have to sort of know how a meeting runs when you can frame these provisions. E-voting? E-voting is very good. We have moved away from how uh, our normal election polls were conducted in Bihar, where you have the booth capturing and results were declared before even vote was casted. So similar situation was there in the corporate world. I think it was a huge amount of booth capturing in a different form and different shape and size. Today you have a comfort of a shareholder who can sit in his, at his house and, and cast right. a vote, which is a phenomenal thing. You have seen in many companies in last at least two or three months, the percentage of people's participation into voting has gone up and gone up substantially. I don't have a problem with that. I would at, agree with Tata, Tata Motors. Tata Motors won't have lost the resolution. Not that I'm, I'm, I'm saying that it was, it, it was a bad resolution to have lost by Tata Motors. But they did not do the work. In fact, I'm coming back to Cyril's point. Do companies really explain to the shareholders why this resolution is so much needed for the company? Point is that we have gone into the e-voting, but we are really not taken into consideration how we should be informing shareholders to seek his vote. I'm saying beautifully intended provisions, and yet you can already see within the first five months that there are loopholes available or extreme confusion going on, right? But Menka, the point to which Cyril is making, and I, I uh, agree with him that consider the fact that what it was until this act came in, what was the situation in India on, 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 on all this related party and other transactions and all that. From there to where we are, and more importantly, mm. as move, we move forward to clause, amended clause 49 mm. from 1st October 2014, I think for the listed companies, and today mm. at least our, our discussion is largely for, uh, 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 for that universe, listed yeah, companies. Because we're talking about public so, shareholders so and minorities. I, 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 th I think the bar has already been raised by SEBI even more than MCA. Mr. Singh, okay, I'm going to interrupt you here, sir, for one second. I agree that this law intended to help and support public shareholders or empower them further, right? But we've just discussed instances where public shareholders have not got the coverage of the law that they hoped for. Let me give you one more. When it comes to objecting to a scheme, till April 1st, or actually even now because the scheme section has not been notified, anybody can go to a court, even if they own just two shares in that company, and object to the scheme. That was one extreme. The other extreme is in this new act, which is only if you have 10%. 10%. Now, I can understand if you have two shares, you cannot hold up a, you know, a scheme of demerger or whatever for one year or six months or whatever it takes. But it can't be that you have to own 10%. Even LIC will fall short of that threshold sure. in many cases. That means they won't have a voice in the scheme. No, that, this is a point which we, we also saw and we felt very, very uh, uh, bad so about there, it. There that is there is 10% is too Huge schizophrenia in the, in the act. That's what I'm trying to say. The intent this seems to be on the outset. This was a point I've been making on previous shows as yeah. well, that there is a lot of confusion in terms of whether it's you know, pro-minority protection or not, and there's a, there's a very different outcomes. Confusion notwithstanding, the Companies Act does go some distance in empowering minority shareholders. But now the majority is questioning this loss of voting rights. Is majority the new minority? Correct, because that goes in the sort of whole root of what is corporate democracy. Let everyone vote. When there's a conflict, I can still see the perception of where you have to fight, whether disclosure alone was the answer, or there should have been some guidelines in terms of what kind of transactions can be put through. So I'm not going to debate that too much. Uh, but I think we've gone the other extreme in terms of making the majority the new minority. I beg to differ with uh, Cyril. Uh, I would have been surprised issue. if you did. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, all shareholders are should have a voice and are same. And the people who run the businesses in India, and particularly India has specific situation, so you can't draw any parallel on that. If they have a resolution in which they are interested or perceived to have some interest in that, I think minority should have a say completely on this, that either we are agreeing or we are not agreeing. I, I'll, I'll put a case in point, and again, Cyril will not uh, 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 have a debate on this, is Maruti. For them to agree that Suzuki can set up 100% subsidy to produce the same kind of thing what they are doing here and if it is not a subject matter of min uh, ma ma majority of minority then I think we have lost the battle because I asked Mr. Bhargava this question that are you really talking as a chairman of Maruti or a representative of Suzuki and he didn't have an answer to this. Companies have been complaining and going through a very difficult period of adjustment for the last six months but if the benefits of the law and what it does for you know the standard of corporate governance in this country overwhelm that period of adjustment, then it's been well worth it. 
or me, the benefits of the law don't make up for all this adjustment pain that's been experienced by everybody. As we began saying that's that, what I'm asking you. As we began has it that been that worth it? it Will it change governance standards in India Inc? I think it already has. There are two, three things, Menika. One act itself cannot uh, change the whole corporate governance. My and question is simple. Has the pain been worth it? Is it no, worth I think he's questioning whether transition? there has been any pain at all. Yeah, well, there is pain. Mr. Singh, I know you don't get it, but there is pain. Companies are figuring out. <laughs> like, for instance, even the sheer, do you have to reappoint your independent directors or not? But these you know, are transition pains. Yeah, I know. Pain. But this no is, pain I don't think there's corporate. What is the pain in there? Then even, even a person getting married also pains. Or finding a woman director. Or finding a woman director. It's not a pain. No, finding a woman director on board. Yeah. Yeah, no. It's so difficult to find. Uh, um, well, I think for many so. companies, they claim it has but, been tough. But, but, but yeah, but uh, again, the point is that they have not said that women has to be independent. So I think, as it is, I often say that most boardrooms in India are like bedrooms, and this one clause <laughs> will make it complete. <laughs> But almost every problem that we have discussed today or every arises out of bad drafting. Every single issue we have discussed on the table is a bad drafting issue. Uh, except perhaps for whether the majority should vote or not, which is more philosophical issue hmm. and it's not a drafting problem. <laughs> Everything else has been a drafting Thank you. problem. <laughs> so you would say this act has been game changing? I think so. If, if I look at it also as the trigger to the SEBI change, if you look at it cumulatively, but the primary trigger being the Companies Act, I think it's been a game changer. Would you say this is game changing? Mr. Shroff has said this is game changing. Not yet, Menka. So, picture of Ibaki. Companies Act, a special presentation by The Firm.